Okay, here we have our man today. His name is Jim Al Khalili. He was born in Iraq, but he's a British citizen and he studied in England. And uh, he's a, supposedly a theoretical physicist, author, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I covered that last week, or yeah, last week, I guess. And uh, what do I think of good old Jimmy? Well, I think he's a caricature of a scientist. Why? Because all he's done is uh, learn by rote. He had to get his degree. In order to get his degree, he had to be a yes man. Had to be a little choir boy, little altar boy. He's got to. Um, repeat what his teachers taught him and uh, otherwise he doesn't graduate he doesn't get an advisor for his PhD so if he got to the PhD level it's because you know he had an advisor who uh, said hey you better fall in line then you'll get a job you'll have a great career if you buck the trend if you're against the uh, uh, bishops in at the Vatican you know you don't get to be cardinal you don't get to be pope the only way you get up there is you if if you know if you bow down to the powers that be and so this guy's one guy that bowed down you know and now he's got a great career being a uh, popularizer of so-called science mathematical physics if we can call that science and uh, all his explanations are irrational so all he does is just um, talk about you know what the mathematical establishment believes okay and so that's it you know that's that's essentially who he is and that's how he makes his money today and so what happens with Al-Khalili well he wrote a book summarizing essentially what the mathematicians believe today and what they're into so if you always wanted to know what these guys did uh, are into what does a mathematical physicist do I mean what kind of job uh, description does a mathematical physicist have I mean, you have these guys w uh, working in Cambridge, you have them working in uh, uh, Harvard and uh, Stanford and uh, all over the place in every university. What do these guys do? They do equations every day. I mean, they drink coffee. Uh, they, they go to the water cooler and just shoot the bull around. I mean, what do they do? And so he wrote a book and uh, it's The World According to Physics, okay? So uh, in that book, again, a popularization, uh, Al-Khalili talks about um, what physics is all about, modern physics. And we have a problem with that because uh, I mentioned this some time back. We had Max Born, and Max Born uh, said, look, physics has changed quite a bit. He said the, this in the 60s where he when he wrote his book 62 or 68 he wrote a book and he says that in there he says look physics is not what it used to be okay we went from the 19th century where the mathematical physicists were very naive and they thought it was the end of physics and it turns out it was just the beginning of physics or mathematical physics because they invented in the 20th century they invented general relativity quantum and later on much further on uh, string theory and none of that, none of those uh, branches or cults, as I call them, uh, belonged in the 19th century. They had no idea about those things. They just had the, these, uh, what, what is known as classical mechanics. And with quantum mechanics and general relativity, you know, that all changed. But in what way did it change? Well, it changed as, um, as uh, Max Born said, uh, it has become more abstract especially string theory. I mean, string theory is so abstract that even the, the great folks who earned Nobel Prizes in, in the 60s and 70s uh, rail against it because they're saying, hey, you know, what's this got to do with physics and what's it got to do with science if science is about proving through experiments and you can't even run an experiment to prove anything about uh, string theory. It's just uh, some kind of variation of mathematics, but what does it have to do with the physical world? And one of the concerns there is they built all these accelerators, and the uh, string theorists have no use for them. <laughs> Essentially, they say they do that they're going to do some experiments to find out this and that, but no, because they're all the, the only difference between string theory and quantum mechanics. Essentially, the string theories uh, theorists 
they accept everything in quantum mechanics. They just say that each particle of quantum mechanics in the standard model, it's just a vibration of a string, a one-dimensional string that is vibrating in, I guess, in all directions to make a three-dimensional particle, you would think, right? And so it's not just up and down, it's just wiggling in all directions. And so a particle is a movie, just like an orbital is a movie. A bunch of orbits makes an orbital where a bunch of string 1d string motions or vibrations or excitations makes a 3d particle which is actually a zero dimensional particle because the quantum talks about point particles zero d point particles so you know we we've lost track of physics and uh, you know getting back to max born essentially uh i think uh, he said it very clearly uh so-called physics meaning mathematical physics has become more abstract and it turns out the word abstract is the opposite, the antonym of physics. What is physical is one thing, and what is abstract is something else, is the opposite. And so they should call it abstracist or abstra uh, something along you know, th those lines. Uh, uh, what do you study? I study abstractions, not physics. I study abstracist or I'm an abstracist. I'm not a physicist, I'm an abstracist. That's what they should be saying. Because it's, if it's become more abstract, then it's gotten farther away from physics. Physics is the physical world. These guys are into an abstract world, more so with string theory, which is just pure mathematics and nothing solid. It's just nonsense. And so this is the issue. And so this is what he covers in his book. He covers that in a little video that he made, okay, uh, Jim Al-Khalili. And um, here's a summary of uh, my take on his notions of what physics is and his argument that he's going to include in his book. And here you get a rundown so you can decide whether you are going to buy that book or not, if it's worth reading for you. Okay. I'm just going to give a rundown of it. Okay. And um, let's go with the first one. Uh, he goes through a history of the, how the math magicians arrived at their conclusions. Uh, in the, um, he asks this question is, is it the end of physics here? And he says, no, because, see, we thought it was the end of physics at the end of the 19th century, but it turns out that they found out a lot more in the 20th century, and it was not even nearly close to the end of physics. And then from there, they moved on to the 21st century, and at the end of the uh, 20th century, they said, well, is it the end of physics now? And uh, the answer, again, is no. And why? Because they said, well, look, uh, just this century, we discovered gravity waves a short while ago. We also discovered the Higgs, for which uh, Peter Higgs received a Nobel Prize. And the issue here was that these two um, phenomena were predicted uh, in the 20th century. In the case of gravity waves, it was predicted by Einstein in 1916. And in the case of uh, the Higgs uh, boson, it was... Um, predicted in the 60s by Peter Higgs. And then uh, we confirmed them at the beginning of the 21st century. So uh, obviously they confirmed their foregone conclusions. Uh, it would have been interesting that they would not have confirmed them, right? And um, so he, he makes a comment. He says, the only real unexpe uh, unexpected surprise was made in 1998. And I thought he was referring to the rope model because that's when I discovered the rope uh, hypothesis, 1998. But no, he was referring to the fact that 70% of the universe is dark energy. He said that was discovered in 1998 and that opened up a new can of worms. Now we have this dark energy and dark matter, which we know nothing about, but it gives job security to the new generations. Okay, you know, they can do a lot of math there to keep them busy. And uh, but and one of them, uh, another thing that has developed or evolved is string theory. He says it's useful mathematics, even though a lot of uh, mathematicians don't believe in it or believe it's part of science. Uh, but he said we shouldn't give up on them because it's uh, mathematics that we can still use. It could be useful mathematics. Then he goes on to space. He says uh, space is the distance between things. And he goes through this rigmarole, which I went the other day, uh, in which he removes particles from a vacuum chamber and says, well, have we removed everything? And then he just ends up saying, well, space is the distance between things. Okay, that's it. That's his conclusion. But then he, he adds, he says that the mathematicians don't understand the nature of space. Well, I thought you just defined it as the distance between things. 
and essentially what he's saying is that's how they use it. So they have no idea uh, what space is to this day. After 2,000 years or more, 3,000 maybe, um, of talking about space, they still have no idea what space is. He goes on to go in, uh, to talk about quantum mechanics, and he says, extremely successful in depicting and explaining phenomena at all scales. Interesting that he words, uses the word explaining because uh, he does make a point of saying that uh, mathematical physics only describes. And then he talks, uses this word explain. So obviously he doesn't understand the difference between an explanation and a description. But continuing here, he says, without QM, we wouldn't have computers. Another fib that a lot of people just repeat. You know, we didn't develop computers because of QM any more than we develop uh, uh, atomic weapons because of QM. And you want proof? I'll give you proof. Iran knows QM, quantum mechanics. They know it by heart. They know all the math. They don't have a bomb. So clearly, you know, QM doesn't lead to the bomb. And just like that, QM doesn't lead to computers. Computers uh, were developed by trial and error, just like uh, Thomas Alva Edison, you know, developed the uh, filament. Uh, due to trial and error. He, he used no math and used no quantum. He just went in and tried different materials until he hit it, you know, uh, with the uh, carbon-based uh, filament. Uh, but he says, but QM is only theory in history that does, is the only theory in history that does not have a unique interpretation, meaning they don't have an explanation. In fact, if you look at all the explanations, they're all retarded. They're all uh, magical, okay? And then he adds, he says, this is a direct quote, we have yet to find the way nature behaves. That means they don't have a theory. They don't have a, there is no such thing as quantum theory. All we have is quantum description, no theory, no explanation whatsoever, because they have no idea how nature behaves. They cannot explain that. And then uh, he says, uh, one of the reasons is that all experiments come out the same, regardless of which interpretation you take, whether you take the Copenhagen interpretation or the many worlds, they all come out the same but uh, they don't help us discriminate between which interpretation is correct. Correct means your opinion. What's correct to you is, for you is incorrect for me. So correct should not be used. And again, he says they all make the same predictions, which again has nothing to do with physics, okay? So what's the issue? Uh, he brings up the issue that Bohr and Einstein had two different outlooks or ways of looking at um, physics. Uh, uh, Einstein apparently wanted um, physics to be something that explains something about the real world, whereas Bohr says, you know, you cannot explain the real world. You're asking for something impossible. All we can do is describe it. And here it is. Uh, Einstein put that in his book, which he revised all the way till the day of his death in 1955. And he says, if we imagine the gravitational field to be removed, there does not remain any flat space time, but absolutely nothing. In other words, he thought that space was nothing. That's one issue. And then the other issue uh, it was this fight that he had with Bohr, and it's what is physics about? And here it is. He says, uh, here you see the two philosophies there, synthesized. Uh, Niels said, it is wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out how nature is. Physics only concerns what we can find out about nature. In other words, description. That's what he was referring to. Einstein wanted an explanation. He said, the job of physical theories is to approximate, uh, approximate as closely as possible to the truth of physical reality. He was asking for a physical interpretation. Bohr was saying, all we can do is describe. We can just go in there, do a test, and say what we can say about nature, meaning what we can describe mathematically. That's it. That's where physics stops. Einstein wanted something more. He wanted interpretation. He wanted to understand how the universe works. He died without understanding how the universe works. And partly because of his own fault, because he invented this nonsense or was the one who got credit for inventing space-time and general relativity, uh, which was a nonsensical explanation for how gravity works out there. He's saying that the reason the Earth doesn't fly out of the solar system is because there's warp time. Uh, that's the physical entity that prevents the Earth from flying out of the solar system? Warp time? Are you crazy, Aini? Or what, what's your, what's, uh, did you wake up with a headache today? <laughs> okay, so um, um, what Khalili does, he goes into this chart, 
and this synthesizes where physics is today and I modified it a little bit and you can see also the blue uh, uh, entries there that I put uh, those are mine but essentially he says look we have general relativity and quantum field theory okay and they're trying to unify those uh, to try to eventually get to what is known as quantum gravity okay they're trying to find a, a theory of gravity that can unite both quantum and general relativity now what is the problem the problem is that these two theories don't match and the reason they don't match is uh, and that they will never match is that general relativity is based on space-time warp space is what causes gravity according to general relativity that's nothing at all what quantum says quantum says look the way it works in in part of, in the particle world is you throw a particle and you bring the part you bring the target inwards somehow so even though you talk about push pull whatever it doesn't matter the point is these two are two different mechanisms one says ball on canvas the thing falls into the depression. The other one says you throw the particle and you bring it in. So they have mathematics for fields, which is general relativity. That's also where quantum field theory is trying to get to. And then you have quantum, which says particles. And so they had to the, the one of the steps there that they're trying to get in there is that a particle is a vibrating field. Okay, so you see how this is coming together. They're trying to see how they can get, they can merge general relativity with quantum mechanics okay this is the issue okay and of course uh, you know even if they get the mathematics together which i doubt because one is a force and the other one is a geometry a field theory so there's no way they can get them to merge or even have anything in common and that's what string theory is trying to do by the way uh, you know they're, they're trying to quantize space time okay and so yeah Good luck with all that. It just provides job security for all these new mathematicians coming out of colleges, uh, out of colleges. Okay, uh, finalizing here, uh, what Al Khalili does, he puts a um, an idea of how the universe progressed through time, and obviously that first point called the Big Bang that's got quantum in there. You gotta uh, you gotta show how something came out of nothing and what they had to do was turn uh, two particles that come together they form nothing and when they separate they form something and I covered that the other day matter and antimatter electron positron uh, whatever you want to call them X and Y doesn't matter just names and what they're saying is two particles you know black particle and a white particle come together they form a no particle when the no particle separates it separates into a black and white particle that's their theory. I mean, that's how simple it is. Okay, but the interesting thing uh, about um, Khalili is his conclusions. You know, and uh, so he, in there, he tries to synthesize what science is all about. And none of this belongs to science. Science is not just another ideology or belief system. Yes, it is. In other words, mathematical physics, which poses a science, is just another belief system. And, and it is an ideology that they're trying to spread through these popularizers. Uh, it's okay to make mistakes. That's how we learn. No, uh, never, because he, he claims that uh, uh, physicists uh, admit when they're wrong. That's not true at all. You know, there's not a single physicist, so-called physicist, mathematical physicist out there that ever will admit that he's wrong, especially about quantum mechanics or general relativity. Uh, scientific theory has to be falsifiable. Absolutely not. Falsifiable is a personal opinion. What's false to you is true to, to me and vice versa. Scientific result has to be reproducible. No, that's experiments. We don't do experiments in science. And you have to choose doubt over certainty. Neither one. Uh, those are opinions. Simplicity and beauty don't always mean truth. And truth, we clean our noses with. Uh, truth is an opinion. So what's his corollary? He said, we may need robots, computers, and God and magic. I added all these words, okay? I, I just um, changed a little bit his wording, okay? I, I took a little liberty there. <laughs> we may need robots, computers, God and magic to find out how the universe works. In other words, in the end, uh, what he's telling you is they've given up hope. They've given up hope uh, of understanding. In fact, uh, you can take Feynman's words, Richard Feynman. He said, you know, uh, we physicists, they call themselves physicists. We've given up on that. 
I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to make sense. I'm trying to um, interpret, give a physical interpretation for how, especially the quantum world works. Okay, so they've given up on that. And El Khalili essentially says the same thing at the end. He says, "Look, maybe we need a computer, or robots, or androids, or something out there to figure out how all this works, because they they'll have more intelligence than we do. For sure, they'll have more intelligence than all the mathematicians on Earth do." 